Welcome everyone. It's another meeting of the Symmetry in Newcastle seminar, still happening online. So, and the first speaker of today is Jago Antolin from University of Madrid, one of them. I am not going to try to pronounce the name because I would butcher it horribly. So, yeah, that's it. And Jago will be talking about geometry and complexity of positive cones. Okay, uh, thank you, Michal. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, yeah, the university is the Universidad Complutense de Madrid, that's where I'm working, and the other one is the ICMAT, which is a math institute that we have here. Um, yeah, this, this is going to be a, a talk based on joint words with uh, one is with my PhD student, and Lusu and Cristobal Rivas. And the other work is, going, is with uh, Juan Alonso. Uh, Joaquin Broom and also Cristobal Rivas. So just to don't forget my cover before before I start. Um, so I have like a bunch of things. Uh, I could have included a bit more stuff here, uh, but we will see until where we we, we arrive. Um, just. I think the, the topics I'm presenting here, I wouldn't say new, but, but is uh, there are like a lot of questions that haven't been quite uh, studied yet, and, and they are very natural, and they are all associated to uh, left order. So what, what is a left order on a group? Well, uh, it is a total order that is invariant under uh, multiplication on the left. And associated to uh, a left order, we have the concept of a positive cone, which is a sub semi group that partitions your group into positive elements, negative elements, and identity. Okay. And how are these two things connected? Well, if you have a left order, then all the sets that are greater than the identity, they form a, a semi group because the product of two positive elements is positive. And, and because you have a total order, everything is either positive, is, in the, is, is negative, like uh, is in the inverse of this set, or is the identity. And conversely, if you have a positive cone, you can define a total order on your group that is going to be invariant under left multiplication by saying A is less than B, if and only if A inverse times B belongs to the positive cone. So this is, this is quite a standard. And um, what I worried about, or what uh, this talk is about, is, is try to understand uh, this geometry and this complexity of left orders or, or positive cones. So, yeah, in order to describe uh, a left order, we usually think with the binary relation because that's what an order is. Uh, but in order to describe it, it's much convenient to, to think about the, the subset of the group, the positive cone. So if you want to describe it, uh, a natural way to describe an order is just to try to find a, a language, so a subset of, so you, you fix some generating set of your group and, and take some element, some, some set of words in your generation, uh, such that when you evaluate this this language, you get all the all the positive elements. So that will be a, a way of describing your positive cone. And if, if you want to introduce like a measure of complexity of how hard it is to compute this this positive cone, we, we can say, well, we can impose that this language, for example, belongs to some class that we like. And in this case, I will be focusing on, on the concept of, of a regular positive cone, so positive cones that can be represented by a regular language. And the standard argument uh, that one does with, with formal languages is uh, allows you to show that uh, an order is uh, regular that's independent of the generating set. So if you change the generating set, uh, you can find another language that will be also regular and evaluate also to the positive cone. And I, I'm assuming that everyone knows what's a regular language, 
but if not, I, I will do it by example here. So a regular language is, is um, a set of words that can be recognized by a finite state automaton, and that's essentially a, a finite graph with edges that are uh, labeled by uh, letters of your language or sorry, of your alphabet. And, and there was, sorry, the edges also have some orientation. You have some preferred starting vertex. And you have, you declare that some vertices are accepting vertices. And essentially you take a word, for example, t to the minus t squared, t to the minus two t, and you, you follow the arrows. Maybe there are different ways of following the arrows or maybe not. We can do here, let's see if I, we can do here and go t, t inverse, and then, uh, sorry, t, t square, t, t, t inverse, t inverse, and t. So this is very awful, but essentially you follow this path and oh, this wasn't a good idea. Maybe let's go back to this, this one and right. Oh, t, t, t inverse, t inverse, t. So you end up in some accepting state and you accept this word. And you say, okay, this is, this is a word in my language. Uh, on, the, on the other side, side if you, hmm, okay. if you just have something like a, T to the minus one. I don't know why I'm doing this example. Okay, T to the minus one. And you try to do the, the thing that we did before. This will be not accepted, but the other way, but we have more ways to compute the same thing. Okay, we this is a non-deterministic automaton. We can go T, T, T to the minus one, and this gets this gets accepted. Okay. Um, so in this case, we have here an, an automaton that I think I hear there is like a like mistake. These are the uh, words in T, T inverse, such that the number of T's is uh, bigger or equal to the number of T inverses, okay? Um, so this is an example that is good to, to keep in mind, um, just to show you that there are like a maybe not uh, like uh, obvious or not uh, like uh, not all the left orders or not all the languages that will represent left orders have to be like super nice. Well, I mean, probably one could also just take in uh, for the same thing t to the n uh, n greater or equal to zero. This language and this language will evaluate to the same set. That's what I'm trying to say. They will evaluate to the same set but they are different. They are different. And sometimes when we, when we think about uh, language describing the order, necessarily doesn't have to be the nicest one. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes. What if I have T to the four, T to the minus three? T to the four, T to the minus three. Uh, that that probably will not be accepted. You can never have three t to the minus one in a row. Ah, oh, but I just thought the language is a set of things with more t's than t inverses in them. Uh, yeah. So that's yeah, that's a bad description. <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is wrong, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, 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 no, uh, um, yeah. That's a test, I I've passed the test. Yeah, yeah, sorry, that, that, that's, that's what happens when you prepare slides uh, the day before. This is contained here, and there's, yeah, uh, this, this language here, this full thing, this is uh, a one counter language. So this, this full thing here will never be, um, well, maybe not this one. We'll be on that. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, let's let's move on. 
let's move on. I don't, yeah, the, the, the thing is, this is the, it should be the subset of this word that never contains three t to the minus uh, one in a row. Yeah. Sorry for that. And now this is recorded and, and this will harm me forever. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so what is the, that's the complexity, what is the geometry? Well, uh, if you have a regular language, then the set it evaluates onto is coarsely connected. Uh, so what does it mean to be coarsely connected? It means that uh, once you have fixed your space, your uh, generating set, uh, then there is some R such that um, all the R neighborhood of, of P of the positive cone, so this is an element of P and then something of length of most R, this form a connected subset of your Kelly graph. And the proof of this is, is quite simple. Take R to be the diameter of a finite state automaton, giving you the language evaluating onto this set. And if you have your, your automaton you know, starting here and, and, and finishing here, this is your, your word you are following. At each stage, you know, at each vertex, you will, you will be at distance at most, at most R from an accepting state. So you are following this path that represents following this, some path in the Cayley graph at a given vertex. You can find another path of length at most R in the Cayley graph that goes into a positive. Uh, so maybe a very simple example that also will come later, uh, like the, the clean bottle group. This is a left orderable group. Uh, it's not difficult to see that it's, it's left orderable. And, and one thing that is very interesting is that the uh, left orders here are, are finally generated. So once you fix um, if A is positive or not, or B is positive or not, this determines uh, completely a uh, left order. And for example, in this case, if we say that A is positive and B is positive, this thing here, well, this is a sub group by definition. We are saying the sub group generated by A and B. This is this set that uh, I have pictured here is, is half of the Cayley graph. Okay, it's half of the Cayley graph. And that's why this is gonna be a positive cone and, and, and why it will give you an order because if you do P inverse, this is the complement of this minus the identity vertex. So you have like a nice connected uh, positive cone, but um, not all the positive cones are connected. So there is this uh, theorem, Susan Miller and Soren Sunich of 2017. No left order of free product is, is regular. And uh, what I'm going to explain you is how to show this, but in the way I prove it with, with Juan, Joaquin, and, and Cristobal. Uh, so we can prove something slightly stronger and say that no left order on a free product is coarsely connected. Okay? Because by the previous lemma, uh, all regular uh, positive cones have to be coarsely connected. So if there's no coarsely connected positive cones, there's no regular positive. And um, just uh, before giving you the proof, just like a, a, a warning that this is, this is quite delicate uh, because uh, F2, which is a free product of two cyclic groups, doesn't have positive uh, connected positive cone, no connected or connected positive cone. But if you do the direct plot with C, then suddenly you find connected positive codes. That's um, something weird that I will try to explain later why this happens. Um, and in fact, this uh, Han Lu, she proved something quite a, uh, stronger. Not only that they are connected, they are finally generated. So they, they, well, they are, they are, there is one that is finally generated, at least one. And, uh, finally generated positive cones is something somehow difficult to find. Uh, they, are, they are not that common. Anyway, let's, let's prove 
let's prove that uh, the free group doesn't have a uh, closely connected positive cause. Uh, the argument here, it, it will also work essentially for a free power, but let's do it uh, in this case. So let F be an abelian free group and T a tree where you act freely and, and Co compactly, okay, because we are we are only worrying about finally generated groups, and p some positive cone. Uh, so we are going to use two things, okay. That uh, if you have two elements that generate a non-abelian uh, subgroup, so two things that they don't commute, okay. Uh, then. Well, the axes on, on the tree, they will look something like this. Well, maybe axis of G, axis of H. Maybe maybe they're, they're not like this. Maybe are something like that. But they might intersect or not. And the thing is, uh, translating these two axes is the same thing as doing the axis of the conjugate. OK. Uh, so essentially, because uh, because translating the axis is, is getting the axis of, of the conjugates, you can, you're acting on a trickle compactly, you can move the axis basically everywhere, okay, or points of the axis everywhere. Uh, but the axis is, is really the axis of some conjugate element. Uh, so in a left order, uh, if you have an infinite cyclic subgroup, half of the element has to be positive and half of, of the elements have to be negative. So in this axis here, half of the elements uh, will, will be positive. So what we, what we are getting is that if you, if you remove any, any vertex u, okay, then your axis, they, they will only, only one of the branches will cross this thing. So at least you will have a full uh, branch containing any component, connected component that you want when you remove this, this vertex. So in any connected component that you want when you remove a vertex, you will find positive elements. And um, the second thing that we, that we need, uh, the second fact that we need is that if you take you fix an order and you take the maximum element of the ball of radius R, then G inverse times this ball uh, will translate all these elements into things that are uh, negative, okay? Because, you know, uh, if H is in the ball of radius R, then um, G inverse H is less than one if and only if H is less than G. If the multiplying by the left invariance to give you this. So this is the, the two things I need. Okay, because uh, what do I do? Well, I, I I need to show that there are positive elements that are disconnected by a ball of radius uh, as long as I want, no that. That's what I mean to be closely disconnected, that I can find uh, um, two elements uh, that are positive and that they are to go from one to the other, we have to cross something of diameter R that is uh, made of negative elements. So both look like this, axes look like that. And as we said, we can translate um, this pair of axes is in such a way that we will have uh, positive elements here. There are positive elements in this end of the tree. There are going to be also positive elements in this end of the tree. And from going from one to the other, we have to cross this, this negative ball. OK, so that's, that's essentially the argument. I don't know if it was clear or too confusing. Um, So this, this argument, in fact, um, this, this uh, claim one, it's really much more general. If you have a Gromov hyperbolic metric space and you have a group acting there by isometries, okay, this is gamma. Um, 
And the action is what we call of general type. Basically, you have two independent logarithmic elements. <clears throat> then the orbit of the positive cone will accumulate in the whole boundary. Okay. Uh, so this is this is something like um, quite weird. So that that before we have these positive cones that were like half of the space and and have the other half that you didn't have any any positive elements and now uh, you have positive elements that are accumulated in, in the whole boundary so you, you have positive elements everywhere and also you have negative elements everywhere uh, so the ambient geometry imposes things on the on the local geometry of your positive cones um, okay um, so let's that was that was like the the preliminaries uh, like just to give you some examples of the things that we are working about and some results uh, so a very natural way to construct uh, orders uh, is through extensions and I'm just gonna review that and give you some some results that we obtain using uh, group extensions and for that, I need like a slightly variation or a slightly generalization of, of what I had before. Uh, now, if I have a group and a subgroup, we say that this subgroup is uh, relatively order convex or relatively convex if you have a total order invariant under T multiplication on the set of cosets. Okay. And, and we also have the companion concept of a positive con relative to H that essentially partitions the group into positive elements, negative elements, and H. So elements on H, we will not be able to say anything about that. And this is a sub group And both things are, again, related in the same way. So if you have a total uh, left invariant order on, on the cosets, then this set here, so the G such that moves uh, H to a positive coset, if you want, uh, this is a uh, positive cone relative to H. And conversely, if you have a positive cone relative to H, then you can order the cosets by saying uh, AH is less than BH if and only if A inverse B is in G. Okay. Um, why I'm introducing this? Because this is somehow the way of, of building an order uh, little by little. Uh, because if you ha if it happens that you also have that uh, H is equal to you know PH union PH inverse union the identity and and PH is a subsemi group, then uh, then this P union PH times P. This will be a, a positive cone for for G. So, <clears throat> and I will explain this thing in a different way in the next slide. What we are saying is basically you order first like a space of cosets, and then you order H, and with that you get a total order on, on G, which is what I'm explaining here. If you have a subgroup and you have a total left order in H, and uh, total left order on the space of cosets, then you can order G by saying G is less than G prime. Well, I compare first the cosets, and in case that they are equal, then I, I look into this uh, subgroup H, because uh, two elements will differ by something of it. And uh, well, as you see, you have this dichotomy between or, or this way of thinking uh, things with orders or positive cones. Sometimes it's, everything is more understandable with the order, but then it's uh, for some other things like languages, you want to use positive cones. Because if, well, if A, H, and G are finally generated, and these two orders are regular, so I mean that this is regular, for me means that uh, this relative positive cone is represented by a regular language. 
then this order here that we just defined is also regular, okay? And why is that? Well, because you construct it like this, the positive cone. So it's a regular language union, a product of two regular languages. And, and that's the lemma. Okay. When we have these type of orders, uh, I usually call them lexicographic because you are splitting the, the group into a direct product if you want of the causes and age. And, and you are ordering this direct product of two sets uh, lexicographically, and you are looking to one of the factors to the side, and then you look to the second one. And uh, well, an immediate corollary of this uh, little lemma, this construction is that since uh, set was has regular positive cones, then poly poly set groups, poly infinite cyclic groups, have uh, regular vectors or regular positive cones. Okay. Um, well, <clears throat> so this is this is the construction that we have before. But now suppose that, that we have uh, this coset space to be uh, an infinite cyclic group. Okay, suppose that we have a map, a homomorphism from G to Z, and then we just uh, assume that, well, because G, are, we assume that it's left orderable, then the kernel is also left orderable, and, and we can put some order there. Uh, we have a very natural, two natural orders on C, and then we construct this, this uh, total order on, on G by the same construction as before. We evaluate on to C, see which is bigger, and in case that we have a tie, we, we use the kernel to decide what happens. Okay, well, when, when we have this, this type of orders that are coming from this, uh, uh, extension, okay, and, and they are so lexicographic where, where the infinite cyclic group uh, leads, then uh, the Bieri Neumann struggle theory tells you that the positive cone is going to be coarsely connected if and only if the kernel is finally generated. So this, this geometry of, of your positive cone is not only detecting uh, some complexity of, of your set is also detecting some algebra of, of, of your group. And so this is directly from uh, the normal sterile theory. And in, in my work with uh, Cristobal Rivas and Han Luzu, we also show that for these orders, we have that this thing that we have constructed is a, a regular left order, if and only if uh, the uh, left order that you have on, on M was red. And well, just um, tell you that what we did, the lemma, this is the lemma. No, the lemma that we did before is that if uh, this order was regular, and on C we definitely have regular orders, then this one was regular. The other, the other direction is not hard, but it's not completely obvious. And I'm just gonna give you a, a brief sketch because I'm going to use this, this thing later. Uh, but first, just uh, a quick recap of Mary Neumann's trivial theory. Uh, we just say that a uh, homomorphism from a group to other uh, reals belongs to the uh, BNS invariant number one or the sigma one, if and only if the pre image of uh, the positive. Uh, the positive numbers are a connected set of the Kelly graph. And the theorem of Beer and Mestrello says that the kernel of this uh, homomorphism is finally generated if and only if both uh, phi and phi inverse belong to sigma. Um, here we, we essentially, we don't have the phi and the phi inverse. We, the natural thing will be putting here phi inverse but essentially, because uh, we are we are worrying about mm, left orders and and, uh, 
we, we have some now I'm 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 no, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, okay. <clears throat> that's fine. Um, well, yeah, as, as we we're saying, the corollary is having no closely connected positive cone implies that the first sigma, uh, the sigma one invariant is, is empty. And what we just did is uh, very similar to the standard proof that the free groups have empty sigma one. Okay, the, the proof I did before is a bit more general because having no coarsely connected positive cone is a bit more general than having no morphisms to R with a connected uh, kernel, but the ideas are essentially the same. And one thing that we don't know is that if there are a left order all group G with empty sigma invariant, uh, sigma one invariant, but uh, with coarsely connected positive cones. Okay, maybe. So you can you can think left orders uh, as a generalization of maps to R. If you have a left order, what you have is uh, an action by homomorphism on R. That maybe it's not a, a homomorphism, but you have an action by homomorphism on R, and, and and that's like a more general type of you know, this type of map. Um, so yeah, that's something we don't. We don't know. Okay, uh, going going back to this uh, second part of this theorem. Um, so as I said, there is something missing that if you have a regular lexicographic order on, on the group with little factor uh, the quotient that is uh, intrinsic cyclic and the kernel is finally generated, then the restriction of this order on n, I want it to be regular. So this is this is. I mean, I'm not saying this is hard, but this is not completely trivial. Uh, well, you, you think you're going to insert the favorite one, so you can, you can uh, because this thing of being regular is independent of generating sets, you can think that you have a generating set for, for your kernel n, and then you have key t inverse that are going to be mm, some elements that, that um, some pre images of, of, of the generators of, of C, if you want. So your language will be contained here. Uh, so uh, something regular, the value is to the positive cone. And essentially what you want to do is, is to do L uh, intersecting with X star. This is, this is what this should be your regular positive cone uh, for N, the, the restriction. But that's not completely true that wouldn't work, uh, but what, why, why it works is, um, is because when you map this language onto only, you forget about the x's and you look only to p and t minus one, this must be a regular language that evaluates to, to the positive elements of, of c. And there are not that many regular languages that are containing t and t inverse that evaluates into positive elements of, of C. All the languages are essentially, essentially like uh, this one here, the one that we did at the beginning. Um, we will only have, we, we will control how much we can use the T inverse. So we cannot use T inverse in, a, uh, in an unbounded way because that will break the regularity because then we will have to count how many T's and T inverses. Uh, so there's a way of formalizing this, but the, the key thing basically is that there are not that many uh, regular languages uh, in TT inverse that evaluates to positive elements. Uh, <clears throat> so that's why we get that this subgroup is basically what we call convex relative to the language. That means that if you have Two paths representing elements of the language that are uh, n in n, then they are in, in a neighborhood of, of n. You, you are <clears throat> so the, the convexity of the order of, of, of the order as a subgroup gives you some geometric convexity for this case, only for this case. I mean, 
mean, you have some more real uh, wild potion. I don't know what will happen. Uh, and then tweaking a bit this language, that's, that's the one that we are hoping to, to evaluate onto, onto the restriction of the prohibited con to your subgroup. Well, uh, doing, yeah, doing a variation of this, uh, you get like a regular language that indeed evaluates there. Okay, so that's, that's more or less the, the idea. It's not too difficult, but one has to do something. And uh, why are, uh, what I am telling you this? Well, because one of the theorems that we get that is, I think, nice, um, is the classification of uh, left orthodox groups that admit only uh, regular left orders. So only all the left orders that they have are regular. And, and the proof goes as follows. If you have a group that admits only uh, regular left orders, then you have to have countably many, okay? Because there are countably many uh, finite state automata. But um, Linnell showed that either you have uh, finally many uh, left orders or, or infinitely or uncountably many, okay? So if you want to classify the groups that only have regular left orders, then you will have only finitely many. <clears throat> and then Tadarin classify the groups that have only finitely many left, um, left orders. And these are basically generalizations of the, of the claim bottle group that I showed you at the beginning. So if you have finitely many left orders, then you have a subnormal series uh, zero, the one to the n, such that all the uh, factors are torsion free abelian groups of, of prime one. So basically, gi, gi plus one, this is a subgroup of, of the rationals. And no uh, quotient, uh, gi, gi plus two, so every jump of two is biorderable. Okay. So biorderable means that you have a total order on your group that is invariant under left and right multiplication. So all the groups, they have a, a unique subnormal series like this. And moreover, all the groups that uh, you admit on G are lexicographic in the sense that, uh, that uh, in the construction that we have before, but with much many factors. You know, if, if you have well, G1 is, GN is trivial, Gn minus one will be convex for the ordering Gn uh, minus two. And essentially uh, we have to fix uh, an order on the quotient that because it's a subgroup of here, there are gonna be essentially two options and uh, ordering on the quotient on the kernel that basically will be also two options. So all, all this group, they have two to the n possible order. Okay. So what we have is a combination of, of this theorem that we have before. A group admits only uh, a regular left order, if and only if you have, again, it has to be a tiring group, a subnormal series like the one that we have before. But it basically has to be a polycyclic group. So every quotient has to be cyclic, nothing, no finally, no infinitely generated subgroups can appear. And then the only possibility for not having a, a, a group of this type that is uh, not biorderable is that you have the claim bottle group, okay? In the claim bottle group, you have something like A, B, A inverse is equal to uh, B inverse. And this, this cannot be uh, biorderable because you know B has to be less or equal to the B inverse or say the other way around would be like more natural, but uh, both possibilities are possible. Both possibilities are possible, yes. Um, and if this is invariant under, under uh, sorry, let me just what I'm what do I what I'm writing here? Um, oh. Okay, I don't write anything. Before, before, 
creating any, any more confusion. Essentially, you cannot conjugate something that was positive into something that was negative um, if you are by order of all. And an example of a Tarian group that is not of this form is, is the band flexory target groups. Uh, no, for example, uh, this one, uh, BS1 minus Q, that we conjugate A into A to the minus Q. So you have the zero that is G, you have uh, G1 that is the normal closure of A, which is isomorphic to uh, adjoining one over Q to, to Z. Okay, this is an infinitely generated subgroup. So because of Bier and Marcel, you know that here you will not you will not have a regular left order. And and well, the sequence finishes here. Uh, and well, something maybe curious is that if you change if you change uh, the negative exponent by a positive one, then suddenly you you will have regular left orders. Okay, you have regular left orders, and these are a bit uh, strange in the sense that you have again this sort of like sequence. Yes, one uh, Q set one, and although maybe this doesn't make much sense. The order that you put here is again like some sort of lexicographic order that you order this and then you order that. But instead of, of checking first things in the quotient, you check first things in the in the kernel. And that's something that you usually cannot do, but in this case, uh, you can do that and that and that uh, sort of works. Okay. Um, so I guess I have uh, 10 more minutes. So I have two more results that I could talk about. Um, I think I go for this one. So recall that we said at the beginning that no uh, left order on free products is regular, but if you embed uh, a free group of rank two uh, into F2 times Z, suddenly you, you find some regular positive cone there. Uh, definitely, it cannot be lexicographic. It's uh, the thing that, that we proved before. Uh, you cannot order first F2, then order Z, and say, OK, I'll check if things are uh, big or not in this component, and then I, I, I go there. The lemma that we, or the theorem that we showed before, or, or I indicated before, tells you that you cannot construct a, a regular left order in that way. So you have to do something different. You have to do something. Uh, strange, maybe not that strange. Um, and the, the way of doing that comes from what we call an order in quasi-morphism. So <clears throat> an order quasi-morphism for us is a map from G to Z such that well, we have some sort of kernel, the elements that go to zero form a subgroup. Um, it's um, symmetric in the sense, so tau of g is equal to minus tau of g inverse. And this is the fact that is telling you that it's a quasimorphism. So this is a quasimorphism of, of defect one. You do tau of g plus tau of h plus tau of g h inverse. Then uh, if this was a true morphism, this should be equal to zero. Uh, what we are saying is that we, we allow a small error. We allow a small error of, on, on, the, on the product. Uh, so you have uh, a function that satisfies these three things, then the elements that are mapped uh, by tau to positive elements, little positive elements, this is a positive cone relative to H, to C, to this kernel. Okay. And we say that this is an order in quasimorphism for G with kernel C. Um, so one thing I, I prove uh, with, with Warren Dix and Soren Sunitz uh, some time ago, basically generalizing some previous work of them, is that if C uh, is relatively convex in A and B, so meaning that you know uh, A 
uh, the coset of A by C is left orderable and the coset of T uh, by C is left orderable, then the free product of A and B amalgamated over C admits this type of quasi-morphism, of this ordering quasi-morphisms with kernel C. Uh, and this is a very nice construction is, is using the Basel tree and I mean, it's very nice, but there's no way that I can show you that uh, right now. Um, but basically taking that, <clears throat> what we do is that if we have a subgroup C of A and B, uh, all these things are finally generated. And A and B, they have a regular positive cones relative to C. Okay, so, you know, the positive cone the form P uh, union P inverse union C is the whole thing and units are disjoint. Uh, then we have this uh, ordering quasi-morphisms for, for this group. Uh, and these ordering quasi-morphisms are computable by a transducer. So what do you mean by a computable by a transducer? Um, this is essentially like before. Uh, we have a finite state automaton as before. We have like a finite graph with an initial edge, uh, so initial vertex, some final vertex, some uh, things labeled by uh, elements of here A and B because we are doing it for F2. <clears throat> but if you see at in some of the edges, we have some extra decorations. And this means that uh, to move along this edge, you read nothing, okay, the epsilon means nothing, but you output a T, okay, or maybe here you read nothing and you output a T inverse, and here you read nothing but you output, output a, a T to the minus two. So <clears throat> essentially, you start here, you read your word in A's and B's, and you finish here, and in the way you are reading your word in A's and B's, you output some words on T's and T inverses, and this word in T's and T inverses is essentially the number of T's minus the number of T inverses give you the tau of A and B. So what is the value of this quasi-morphism on that word? Okay, so computable with a transducer basically means um, that, uh, that you have a finite state automaton that computes the, the, the quasi-morphism. And um, I'm going to just tell you how to use this to create a, a regular positive cone. Uh, essentially, you, you said that um, you know, we, we, we have that this tau, in this case, from F2 to Z, and it's not going to be only two sets. This is going to be to two sets um, plus one, in fact, union zero. So it's only going to take uh, this quasimorphism. It's only going to take um, uh, odd values, odd values, and uh, or zero. So you you in F two cross C you say uh, that uh, gn is is positive uh, if and only if tau of g plus 2n is greater than zero so this is going to be a total order because well because this ordering quasimorphism that we have here has a trivial kernel um, and because here we are taking odd numbers and, and here you put that when you have even numbers, this sum will never be zero. The only way that is zero is if G is a trivial one and N is a trivial one. So everything is going to be positive or negative. And well, one, one is able to do this in such a way that it works. And essentially what we, we, what we have to do is, what we have to do is, uh, when we read some word on A's and B's, we want to keep all the times compatible with, with uh, the n factor to, to leave all the times in, in like a level zero of your ordering, or well, maybe not zero, but minus plus and minus one. 
So what we do is take this, this automaton and say, okay, if you go from here to here and you were supposed to output a t to the minus two, well, now what we're gonna do is force you to also read a t to the two, okay? So if, if the, if the, you know, the tau quasimorphism is, is outputting for you a t to the minus two, then in your language, you are forced to read a t square. So <clears throat> you will be reading things of a and b's and t's in such a way that you are always like in, in the level zero or close to level zero. And when you finish reading your A's and B's, then because you're in a diet flow, you can read as many T's or T-mers as you want and, and you need to, to get whatever you need in the, the second factor. And, and that will be basically your, your regular order. So in some sense, uh, you are using this, this quasi morphism and the, and the diet plot we've set to, to embed your group in, in like in a diagonal way if you want into, into F2 cross C. And this, well, essentially this working in general, if you have an order in quasimorphism with kernel C that is computable with a transducer, then, uh, and if moreover this, this kernel admits a regular left order, then you have uh, a one counter left order on G that, well, that doesn't, sorry, it's not the most important part is this one. That if you cross G with Z, you have a regular left order in, on your group. And um, just uh, you know, as a corollary, if A and B they both admit regular left orders, then uh, the free product doesn't admit a regular left order, but the free product times C it does. So uh, Halu had find this positive cone uh, here a bit in a different way. It was a bit. I wouldn't say by accident. We were looking, we are trying to understand the space from here, but definitely we didn't have like an explanation why the positive cone that we have here will that was regular will generalize, and now we have you know an explanation. And with this construction and other little things, you can find small families of groups that that meet regular left order, for example, these coherent by tangent arting groups that are not free products, they will have left order. And I think I'm I'm gonna stop here because it's it's time for me to stop. Thank you, Iago. Um do we have any questions? So yeah. Liz oh, oh Thomas. No just one question. Hey, you know the slide with the with the um, yeah, with the climb bottle group, the last slide where you had the the last the, yeah like the where, yeah this one this one um, when you gave the description of the of the groups you know with this uh, subnormal sequence mm -hmm. yeah isn't there a bound of the length when you know that when you consider two that they have to be climb bottle or can you do you have any no, is I, I, any I, length possible you can have any length uh, yeah any length yeah yeah that, that there is no no restriction there essentially uh essentially is is yeah, each each new letter has to conjugate the previous one to its inverse and, and that that's and yeah well, the okay ones to the inverses, and that's that's essentially I see, yeah. So, uh, I see. So, basically, all what you add, you have always the action by inverting. Yeah, you always have the action by invert. That's, that's the thing that kills the, that, that kills the, the biorderability. Okay. Okay, fine. Thank you. And, and because you have, yeah, because, oh, yeah, you don't, okay. Okay. I do believe Murray had a question. Yeah, I was just going to ask if those examples at the end were not known before to have regular left orderings. Uh, well, uh, 
this this all these ones are are uh, yeah uh, all, all these ones we didn't know that they have regular left orders uh, at all. Um, I mean, it's, it's as I said at the beginning, this is something relatively new in the sense that, that not that many people have looked to this type of questions and since not that so long. I mean, probably the first person that has been looking to these things more seriously is, is Soren Sunich and his first papers are like from 2013, 14. Um, and Soren and, and, and Susan in, in their paper where they show that there are no uh, regular left order on a free product, they look to right angle arting groups. And they, they are able to show that if the diameter of the graph, of the defining graph is, is uh, three or bigger, then essentially, this not completely, but essentially there are no uh, regular left orders there. And they were not able to do it for smaller uh, diameters. And that's exactly what happens when you have uh, these coherent racks. They have a diameter two, I think, or so, yeah, I mean, they, but they didn't, so they didn't know how to prove, they didn't have a, a regular positive cone, but they didn't know either how to prove that they have regular positive cones. And in some sense, this this shows why why the theorem they need to have diameter three or bigger. Cool. Okay. Uh, any further questions? Well, it doesn't seem like there are any further well, questions. So then, let's think then, 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 then one more time. Just, then let me just say something very quickly. Uh, because I mean, there sure. was a lot just uh, because the probably the theorem that we are more happy about is, is that this uh, result that I told you for the free groups, we are able to do it for limit groups. OK. And maybe I show you this one. Uh, that for non-abelian limit groups, basically like uh, the argument I showed you before for the tree, but with a lot of asteroids, we promote it for non-abelian limit groups and and something that we, you know, that we didn't know even like uh, a year ago is that the surface group didn't have a regular positive cone. Okay. And uh, we also get as a corollary this this result of the flaco of 2010 that uh, limit groups they have empty sigma one. And, and before I told you that for free groups, uh, having empty sigma one and having no closely connected positive cones, the proof were basically the same. Here we have a completely different proof than the one of, of the flaco. The one of hers is, is quite uh, algebraic, and now ours is, is very, very geometric. We are really finding sets and, and showing that they are separate and things like this. And yeah, I'm very happy with this result. And just because I have one minute, I want to mention. <laughs> OK. OK. So thank you for the talk, Yago. It was really nice. And we will now have a coffee break.